Hi, I'm Chloe Canning. Luminate Leadership acknowledges the traditional custodians on the land which we record this podcast, the Terrible and Yogara people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to Lead with Courage, the podcast that celebrates the bold and inspiring stories of leaders making a difference. We're your hosts, Andy and Cherie Canning, and together we'll dive into the minds of the trailblazers, the risk takers, and those who embrace life with a growth mindset. In this episode, we welcome Mike Davis to the podcast. Mike is a co-founder and CEO of Felix. Felix is an online construction marketplace where people list, find and hire equipment and subcontractors around Australia. Felix are a publicly listed company on the ASX and also one of our valued clients that we've had the pleasure and privilege of working with for almost two years. We absolutely love the leadership displayed by Mike and are thrilled that he's here to share in the conversation of what leading with courage means to him. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Mike Davis, to the Lead with Courage podcast. Thank you for joining us today, Um, fresh off the back of a cancelled Qantas flight this morning, (laughs) uh, but right on time for our podcast. So thanks so much for being here. We're thrilled that you can join us. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Thank Sheree. You. It's a pleasure Welcome. to be here. Welcome. Very exciting. Thanks for to having To the new podcast. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, one of the things that we want to kick off with any guest that comes on is to ask them, what does lead with courage mean to you? So if we can we can get start there, that would be amazing. Yeah, it's uh, that I guess formed the, when think, reflecting over the past couple of weeks since mm. you invited me to be on, I, I, that was the, the first sort of point to kind of zero in on what what is what does it mean to lead with courage mm. um and it it sort of dawned on me that it, it 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 really is different to leading through complexity or leading through really stressful times which also might require and do require really strong leadership and and managerial skills but leading with courage is it's quite profound isn't it mm, i think so when and, done well and it's it's sort of emblematic of character um, and it's quite deep, so we're about to get deep. Yeah, aren't let's we? go deep. So um, that that sort of was the the frame for reference, and I'm, I'm interested to hear why um, through Luminate and their broad leadership work that you do, why it was courage that you zeroed in mm. um, for the podcast. But we can circle back to that. But yeah, I, I took a couple of notes down, and it, it required some real thought of what is it to lead with courage. Um, to me, the things that sort of stood out were sort of Acting, acting that's not in your own self-interest or self-serving and, and sort of putting others before yourself mm. um, and, and really overcoming possibly your instinctual behaviour um, that you may sort of be contradicting to your conscience or your conscientiousness or what you think might be right yeah. and to sort of act authentically or lead authentically so that you can marry those two things up. And I guess your conscience or your judgment and how you're seeing things, you can follow through and act like that. Um, and it's it's not necessarily putting yourself first. Um, I love that. I, I, I sort of thought as well, just sort of coming from a, a sporting background because leading with courage is really sort of, uh, that's drilled into you uh, mm. in the sporting arena and, and often um, – I, I sort of played Aussie rules football and just across the road here was, just as I told you, that's where I grew up playing my, my junior football um, at Morningside. Uh, it's sort of physical acts of courage uh, are how you sort of demonstrate your, your leadership with courage. Um, and in the, the business world and in society and trans, transitioning into those, it's a lot more nuanced, I find, yeah. rather than just sort of, the old colloquial putting your body on your on the line for the team and, and sort of demonstrating like that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's interesting. There's a lot of layers to peel back. Yeah, I think it, you make a great point there. We we had a guest on just recently saying in sport things are quite black and white. Yeah, yeah. You know, we talk about leading with courage in sport. It, it's fairly well defined. It's like did you did you run hard or didn't you? You know, and yeah. and the courage line is almost at at that point based on what people observe. But in business. As you said, it, it feels so much more nuanced, uh, you know, in that way. And in life, sometimes it feels so much more nuanced and, and everyone will have a different definition of it. I think for us, we, we chose the name Lee with Courage because just every other name was taken. Oh. <laughs> it was as simple as that. 
<laughs> so no need to stick to the topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean anything to us. Um, <laughs> no, do you know, I, I absolutely love, and I think it speaks to who you are actually, the depths in which you've considered this question or this um the meaning because or the multiple like lead and courage because a few people come on all of the definitions have been beautiful by the way but just the the depth to which you consider it I think just shows how your mind works and how I did just say before maybe you are the modern day philosopher (laughs) Mike Davis I I think you are uh, but I love that level that you go to well, every session that we have, Sheree, together, at the start, you tell us you've got to show up. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so, How are we showing up? Bring your so best self. This is it. it. Um, yeah, beautiful. And I think I'd love to talk a little bit because maybe our listeners may or may not have read the show notes or be familiar with you. And um, we've got some information there for people to read. But, you know, right now, as you sit here, you're a co-founder and CEO of a uh, publicly listed company, Felix. Um, Felix is, I guess, simply put an online construction marketplace for people to list and find and hire equipment and subcontractors at any time. Have I got that right, the, yeah. the description? We build a software platform for well done. Yes, stuff. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We've it. only been working together for two years, I'd say, and yeah. I've nailed the um, who, what Felix actually do, but yeah. not who you are and why you no, exist, but, um, but what so, you yeah, do. In a, in a nutshell, we build a software platform for the construction and, and really large infrastructure industry. So if... People think about all of the the large infrastructure projects that connects our, our cities and towns. Often Felix will be used to connect um, those construction organisations with all of the subcontractors and workers and suppliers that build and deliver those projects and connect them all together in the one platform. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Building a better way. None, none of which I knew anything about when we started <laughs> out. Yeah, well, and I think that's it. Like I, I want to go, this is this is Mike's title and, and you're a CEO and co-founder of that business, but that's not we're not here to necessarily talk about um, construction, not there's anything wrong with that, but we want to talk about what's led you to this point and the lessons and the courage that's required. And you did just touch on earlier um, AFL football. So across here at Morningside Panthers, literally um, your home ground, but it wasn't just Panthers you played at. It, um, you had a, a piece of your um, sporting career and life. And if you're willing to share about that, I guess what are the lessons learned and the courage that was required for you looking back on that chapter? Sure. Um AFL, Aussie Rules Football was very integral to my childhood and um, juniors growing up and I, it was um, thinking back to, to when we were all the kids, it's all just about the big dreams that you've mm-hmm. got right, and what, what you want to do when you're older and, and that was sort of everything and it was sort of in, in duality with, with sort of computers and IT and business and wanting to start something there. So I always had this sort of parallel train but it was footy first and foremost um, and that journey took me up through state and national juniors and playing for Morningside Panthers and then ultimately being drafted into the AFL for a couple of, a a short stint in the Mm. AFL for a couple of years and had a year at uh, Essendon Football Club in in Melbourne and and then Carlton and then that dream was shattered Um, Mm. and that didn't quite work out and it's, it's a very... I guess, binary industry at the professional level, it's sort of like you're, you're sort of in or, or you're out. And even if you're on the cusp, you're just out. So following that, I, I went and played um, semi-professionally over in Adelaide for a couple of years because that was the, the sort of second best league to go and, and play in to try and work your way back into the AFL. So after, um, after a couple of years of doing that, you sort of start to read the tea leaves and go, well, how much time am I going to continue to invest in this at mm. that level if it's not going to quite work out? So you sort of begin that sort of transitioning process that who am I now? Yeah, <laughs> kind of, kind how of. old are you at this stage? Um, so I, I was nine, 18 when I was drafted. Mm-hmm. So I'm probably 2021 20, going over to Adelaide, sort of coming back 23, mm. um, 24, um, then, yeah, spent a, a few years just sort of fledgling around finding my way. We had a family business which was um, outsourced IT web development um, with uh, development offices based in India and, and local clients down in, in Melbourne and Australia um, servicing IT projects. So that gave me a couple of years of just cutting my teeth in the kind of corporate world and just getting to understand what it's about. But mm. sort of throughout that early adulthood, I'd always had sort of entrepreneurial projects um, running into each other, 
often not quite working out and flailing, but just lessons learned and each one becoming, I guess, in informing you a little bit more of your journey for the next one and, and taking yeah. those lessons and applying them. So, and everything was just bootstrapped um, from day one. So it probably started when I was 14, 15 at school. I got right into sort of computer security and ha- I probably watched Hackers or something like that. <laughs> so that I was sort of obsessed by that world and that um, manifested in um, being invited to speak at a couple of computer security conferences, inviting, wow. and mum had to come along as my chaperone in, in grade 11. And um, How did you go public speaking back then? Just, just you just don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. You just got up and I had braces on my teeth and probably wearing like a, a state, Queensland state football jacket or something <laughs> like that. And it was um, boom time at the time. And I remember getting, a, mum tells the story, a, a couple of job offers. As soon as I'd walked out the Did door, you? I was in grade 11. It was to sort of leave school. She said, absolutely not. He's staying in school. Um, that was probably why I was fa- failing IT class at <laughs> school at the time and just not paying any attention to the curriculum. Um, but it was all bootstrapped and I had to, if I wanted, um, I taught myself to code when I was um, uh, coming, uh, starting a couple of businesses because that's what that required and just learning all the various parts of business, mm. um, a, a sort of a, a, a fashion label at one point and then while I was in Adelaide, we created a key ring that had sort of got you a discount at maybe 200 bars and restaurants and clubs around town and... Um, had that going and then yeah, so all of those sort of things just kind of building you up on this journey and I was involved in another startup um, as this one this opportunity um, with where Felix began came to pass and that was a, um, a, a global um, e-commerce retailer um, for hand-painted canvas art like right. a studio of artists in China and that was sort of going quite well and then the, the Felix opportunity in its inception came up and um, sort of had to jump into that um, after a certain point in time and, and go all in. So it's, yeah, it's been a, a real sort of adventure, I guess, yeah. and experience to sort of get to get to where we are. Yes, so good. And I think it might have been off air before we jumped on, but I heard you say the word like irreverent and that, you know, people not taking themselves too seriously, but you've jumped into all these ventures. How much, like, what's the balance for you taking risks, taking it seriously, but you, are you taking yourself seriously? And I don't mean that you're a, you're a joke, uh, but, you know, but, but more so, you know, so are you just kind, like, oh, oh, wow, really nailing these Feedback's words. a gift. Um, <laughs> Until it's not. I didn't ask permission to give you the feedback, though. Um, no, what I, 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 I'm quite sincere in this around just giving things a go. Like has to a lot of people hearing, oh, I've gone, done this and done that, even just so quickly, like, wow, where do people find that confidence and the courage to to give so many things a go, to take those risks? Yeah, we did speak of this about this a little bit offline and to me those sort of things don't require courage per se because mm. they're almost just hardwired into me and um, for better or worse I've probably got an obsessive kind of level of just kind of learning and, and curiosity and detail and getting into getting into things and really understanding how things work and, um, you know, at times and especially sort of earlier in my development and and sort of growing up, that can mean at times the outside world doesn't exist and you're just Mm. so sort of hyper-focused on on learning and and development and growing something. Um, And that's probably an internal monologue with yourself um, and it's the the sort of – the, the introvert in you, but I, I think sort of externally and interactively and interacting with other people, I, I think my disposition is to sort of lighten the mood. Yes, and yes. And, yeah, um, enjoy and have a good time with everyone and make everyone feel comfortable. And I think finding that balance. It- yeah, it's really fascinating you've used those words and said that because one of the things that really strikes me in working with you and, and working with your team over the last almost two years and then we look at the – the values of the company um, is one of the values is bring the joy. Mm -hmm. And I really see that when we work with you around, you know, obviously you take it really seriously and you've, 
you're a publicly listed company, you've got a lot of responsibilities and compliance, but there's always this lightness when we work with you. And, and I love that. So when many people might look at a listed company and go, are you kidding me? Like a, a company core value is bring the joy. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me about what that means to you and how that's, how it's important to you? Yeah, it was. Uh, Unless you hate that one. No, I, know, I, 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 dro- I drove that one. Yes, I think Yes, of, you did. So I, it, it probably reflective again, just circling back of just kind of my personality and, and mm. who I was, who I am as a person. And I think that my belief is that we as a team, as a business, as an organisation, as an individual, we can really work hard at things and really be focused on outcomes and goals and be tough and have tough conversations. Mm. But we can always kind of balance and harmonise that with enjoying each other's company, having a good time, having a laugh when it's needed. And I think that brings the best out of people. Um, It it establishes a really sort of strong culture where people like coming to work. Mm. Um, they enjoy the people they work with and they feel safe to themselves, kind of enjoy themselves while they're there. And I think as as leaders, um, that's really important to kind of set that tone that, you know, it's okay to enjoy ourselves and enjoy each other while we're here. We're going to be here more than with anyone else in yes. our lives. Um, say for you and Andy who go home together as well. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you've got to have the joy. <laughs> yeah, battle lines are drawn yeah. just over there. If only they were. We need more boundaries. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that, I, I love that. I think that it just speaks to who you are and also the whole organisation, the the team of people that are there. Which I actually do think we go back to the original question about. I think it is linked to courage because it would be so much easier for people to put up on the walls or put down on their website the words that people think, you know, are we a grown up, serious, um, you know, no personality, black and white business. I don't know. I think it takes more courage to go, yeah, I'm going to be a bit different here. Well, totally. And um, I think we can get into to those things. But again, if we think about that sort of your your conscience or your conscientiousness and, and sort of how you end up acting and if 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 that's been chipped away at or, or chiseled away, you're probably thinking, well, who else am I trying to please? Is there yes. another group or um, am I afraid to sort of bring that voice or speak to that because of, you know, other external influences and factors and I'm, mm. I'm compromising I'm compromising my people or my team and, and, and then I'm not serving them for, for other reasons. So it's kind of dialing into what's the most, if we think about it in concentric circles, you know, who am I really serving? And mm. I think as a CEO and a, and a founder, you're serving your team and your staff first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And that's often juxtaposed and there's tension against that because there are always other groups. You have a board that you report to, there are shareholders mm. um, and not everything's always, um, you know, roses in, in terms of just alignment in, in views or, or anything like that. Um, but I think if you if you have that sort of North Star that first and foremost, I'm here to serve the team and the staff, it's a, it's a good sort of grounding direction for those yeah. things. Yeah, so great, so great. I love that. I love the people focus and and I do agree. I think then when our, I mean, it's, I'm not a CEO of a listed company, but obviously you've got to keep our shareholders and boards happy. But when our team are doing great work, then they're doing great work for the customers and ultimately then boards and shareholders are going to be happy too. So I love that balance and that focus. One, sorry, sorry, and it is important to note that, that, that philosophy doesn't come at the expense of making the right decisions in the interests of the business at Absolutely. all times. Absolutely. Um, that's an important, um, uh, that's an important thing to. Distinction. Dis- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Welcome to the conversation, Andy. Um, that is the right <laughs> distinction because yeah, it's so important. People don't think, oh, we're not just here to make everyone feel the joy only. Like we're actually here to provide a great business and yeah. um, drive some really solid results. Yes. And growing a business, growing a business or, or anything is, is always going to come with some hard times mm. and some tough conversations, some challenging things. Things aren't, things aren't going to work out as planned sometimes. You're going to have to retrace your steps. That could mean restructuring. It could mean layoffs. Um, we've had significant external sort of world events that are yeah. influencing those things as well. So to your point, Cherie, you it can be risky or dangerous to think that, well, okay, the, the, 
the sort of the best way to, to sort of act and, and lead and move forward is to put my staff first and foremost. If you're not prepared to sort of have that zoomed out or objective view that it's actually nothing actually becomes the, the business and doing the best thing by the business while we've all signed up to this, that's your most important mm. job and role. Mm. And, and the way that you're going to lead and, and enact that is through um, developing the best people that you can and, yes. and being the best leader. And um, sometimes that means being out in front, sometimes, sometimes that means sitting back, but having that balance of I'm going to be really people focused, but you're going to have to make tough decisions and hard decisions when you need to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because being people focused doesn't just mean always the cheerleading. It's yeah. the tough conversations. It's the big decisions, the structural decisions, which is people focused too, because mm-hmm. if you haven't got the right people on the bus, if you haven't got people doing the right roles, then it's not actually in their best interests or the business best interests. So yeah, it's an important distinction. Mike, if I can take you back to 2012, you've co-founded um, what was Plant Miner, now known as Felix. So um, I think you mentioned before that was an opportunity to start off and, and you and Mike were both co-founded, or trusts as people call him, but yeah, you co-founded together. Um, I imagine, now this is coming from my map of the world here, um, starting a business and then having people join the team where, you know, where do you step step up, step out, you know, whose voice, um, Andy and I make it very clear that there's one key voice here. <laughs> no, no, that sounds terrible, <laughs> but it's true. No, no. Uh, but no, I think that was an interesting conversation for us in the early days of, okay, if we're working here together and seriously, if we're working together, we both bring a very different skill set and shared values and shared ambition, but a different way of approaching it. So if we get at loggerheads or if we get to that point where you go, who's making the call, we were clear on those roles. Totally. And it's, and it's, I'm not sure whether you can relate to this experience or whether this is unique for us, but it's tricky in the beginning where there are sh- so many shared roles and shared duties and you both have quite a different skill set, but there's a natural overlap of things there. You kind of think about the way that a home runs or the way that a home runs for us is that there are fairly defined roles and responsibilities in terms of, you know, you're better in the kitchen than I am, or you're better at the cleaning than I am. And Which so both naturally- of those, by the way, I'm not better at. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to think of one that you are, but <laughs> we're, we're a little, maybe you're a better driver than I am or something. <laughs> but, you know, all those things that kind of lining up to you're able to define roles and responsibilities quite easily That's when you're starting nice. a business and, a, and it's a startup and there's two of you, for example, and maybe some, some others floating around the edges, those roles and responsibilities aren't as clearly defined. Um, mm. Has that been your experience? Uh, absolutely. And I, can I throw in as well, I think one, the roles and responsibilities, but I think what makes and what makes it tricky is ego. Because if I reflect back on the times where I'm like, well, I think we should do this. And then is it is it my ego speaking or is it actually just a real passion for a decision? But what I love about what I observe from you, now your team might say something different here, but no, I'm sure they agree, is that I don't see that ego in the way that you lead. So how do you define, one, how was that experience? But two, how have you learned that courage to kind of leave the ego at the door if you see that the same way here? Sure. Um, so to circle back to where we were at, um, certainly that was our experience. And on reflection, I, I don't think I would ever be an individual founder of a business. Or mm-hmm. maybe I would, but I just wouldn't find it anywhere near as fun as starting out sort of as, yeah. as a couple. And to your point, Andy, sort of you, you – you're almost both doing the one every, you, you, at that um, kind of inception stage and ideation stage where you're really just creating something out of nothing. Every, you're doing everything together, every single conversation, and it's just yes. a back and forth, and then you're just sort of weaving. And that's the, the most fun part, and it's the same as you guys were saying at, yeah. at home, just doing things together and being a team. That's the fun part of it. Yes. Um, and then as you grow and sort of with Dan coming in essentially as a co-founder as as well, who you know, know yeah. well, Cherie, yes. is with us still as our now chief revenue officer, um, inevitably we get, began to grow and more people and little bits of structure evolve by necessity and division of tasks and duties. And I think not just in our experience but in any sort of uh, – speaking to other sort of co-founders um, along the journey, there's always that, 
I guess, kind of courage to speak up early days and everyone takes every, – I've spoken to so many people and they all – struggle with it before they kind of speak up. And I'm thinking on a recent business trip to, to New Zealand that I had with, with Brendan and our team, a, a sales trip, and I was speaking to a, a guy who's moving back to Christchurch to start a business and he had a, a, a co-founder that he was working with and he was struggling with that exact same thing that mm. he didn't see them um, pulling their weight in, in some respects and he was doing all the work, not saying that this was reflective of our journey at all, but him working up the courage to have that hard conversation. Mm. I was sort of like, it, inevitably it became like a bit of a counselling session sitting next to <laughs> yes, each other yes. over there. But I think that people identify their strengths and their weaknesses and where sort of boundaries or should sort of exist and division of duties um, as things begin to scale and get a little bit more organised. Um, and that's just, I, I think, a really classic sort of kind of Found, co-founder struggle to mm. be able to kind of know when to kind of have those early conversations which are a little bit it's kind of like the honeymoon phase is just over a little bit yeah. we're having our first kind of tough conversation as co-founders yeah. right, rather than we're just how great's this idea and we're taking over the world and you know and all just, the uh, how great is the this riches be? that abound yes. <laughs> and, and wait for us yeah and then you and then yeah. it's like the honeymoon is over and you've moved in together and like the, you're not hanging the towel up and you're not putting the seat yeah, on the, the toilet the down yeah, yeah. annoying because those the, the antenna goes off well before you have the conversation yeah <laughs> <laughs> typical, yes. typically so um and i you it's always cathartic when you have those conversations mm. and it's almost like you're, you're kind of dying a little bit inside when you're wrestling knowing you have to have that conversation you're kicking the can down the road and it's eating away at you yeah and i think that it probably segues into your um question around sort of like developing those things sure yes. i think that the more that that becomes familiar with you to sort of take those conversations head on and this is your entire world, guys, and right, this is why yeah, we pay yeah. you the big bucks to come <laughs> and teach everyone. And thank you for that. Um, show them the way is to kind of the more that you become comfortable and um, understand the benefit and the progress that happens from challenging conversations that need to take place mm. at times um, is really important. Um, How did you develop that for you? Like what are some of those moments over your life where you've, I guess, built that courage muscle or the clarity of who Mike is? Yeah, sure. I think um, for me and just through through my lens, a, a lot of it is just kind of your personality and your character because I think that my, the most important thing that I see it is to have an awareness. Mm. Um, and, and if you're really aware of just sort of, all of the different people that are in the room um, and how they're feeling and, mm. and you're dialed into that and you're tuned into those frequencies, then at least you've got the the data um, yes. and the inputs to be able to observe and act accordingly sort of as a leader. Um, yeah. And those, if I think much earlier into my journey, um, those sorts of things would have been a lot more challenging to kind of see things and then sort of act or speak up or, or sort of be a voice. And um, I, I wrote down while I was on the plane, I, I think I just sort of coined three C's as mm. I saw them. It's the yeah. triple C. Um, and, and the first one was character and I sort of had its conscientiousness and it's sort of an innate sense of leadership as well to be able to not only sort of observe and have an awareness of those things but have a sort of a drive to kind of be a voice, yes. I, I think is important. Um, the next one was confidence. And I think that it, it's almost the most, or well, equally the most critical thing because um, I, I find life is just a bit of a confidence game, whether it's yeah. just socially or um, whatever your endeavour is or in business, it's your comfort in, in your own skin mm. often that just unlocks so many personal barriers for yourself to that just so true. get out of your own way. And it's important to understand and note the distinction between arrogance and, and confidence because, yes. as we all know, arrogance is just sometimes um, a lack of confidence in disguise, yeah. right? So yes. that yes. confidence to be able to... Um, act um, and and lead 
what you've observed, if we think about this in a, yeah. a, a, sequ- a sequential way. And then my final C was conviction. And that's just having that sort of action-oriented mindset to kind of, you know, I've observed it, I feel like I'm in a position to, to call it out and I'm, I'm comfortable doing that, whatever it is, I'm just using a nominal yeah. example and then follow through. Yeah, yes, So and I love those. I think if you just kind of work out that framework, then it's like anything, it feels really tough. And, and for me personally, probably my, my natural personality is to be really conflict avoidant. And, right. and that was probably something that was sort of really getting in my own way early in my development as a leader, the ability to sort of have tough conversations, tackle things head on and, and not avoid them. So once you sort of learn to sort of understand the value of taking mm. those things head mm. on and getting into them, it sort of just becomes like anything. It's like riding a bike, right? The practice. Yeah. And and I imagine kind of linking to what you said there, like it's it's getting used to it but also the risks if you don't. Like yeah. what are, what are the outcomes if you don't have those conversations? Yeah. And they're and pretty I, dire Yeah, times. I think when you're becoming a young young adult or a, you, in your teenage years and if, if that's what you're doing, you see adverse outcomes. Yeah. And if you're, you're smart, you kind of learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, I'm either going to build that way and and that's going to be the, the sort of operating framework mm. moving forward or I can see that if that's the sort of continual yeah. kind of behavioural sort of outcome, then... Do something different. Yeah, it's just going yeah. to be a different one. And you had quite a bit of that in, in I'd say, your early years in the, um, you know, you mentioned 18, 19 and then having to go over to South Australia to play Aussie Reels football, there would have been some strong conversations or, or strong realisations that you're having with yourself in those moments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for uh, there was lots of different things happening at that time. It's trying to still make it in in, in football and see if that was a a possible um, vocation. Um, while I was sort of fledglingly going through a, an entrepreneurship uni course, um, I did a lot of music production, and again, that was just fueled through a, a love of um, electronic music and having no musical background whatsoever, just decided, well, I'm just going to learn to do what those producers do and um, naively just set about sort of teaching myself music production and how to compose and engineer records and oh, eventually wow. that was signed to a record label and had various releases and then kind of worked out that it's kind of getting hard to make a buck in the music industry and that's not quite going to cut it anymore. So that's another sort of avenue shut off. And thinking back to a kid, it was just always this sort of dream of just cutting it big in something and just yeah. having, mm. making it in something that gave me some sort of creative expression to kind of build and grow. And as those sort of doors and dreams were kind of closing on each other and, and not quite work out, I spoke to Cherie about this. Um, I had a real sort of fear, internal fear of failure that I sort of was going to be almost there in a kind of a number of these pursuits, but never quite there. And, and re- fortunately for Felix, I, I feel like this has been um, a kind of actualization of those dreams and a, a vehicle for that expression. And I think those dreams, if you think back to when you were a kid, I think they were really sort of self-interest driven, just like make it big, get rich, all of these things. Yeah. And I think as you grow up and your worldview becomes more informed and mid- you mature, those values kind of evolve mm. and shift. And I think for me, right up there with the, the greatest parts of um, – doing what I do is just seeing the journeys of people who've come into our business over um, some of them up to a decade now yes. and came in as as young kids, have grown up, they've got married, they've bought houses, they've had kids and it's all been through and yeah. with Felix and their contribution to Felix and, and that's really rewarding. And I, I think for my own personal journey, it's probably found that I, I feel like my greatest strength now and, and learning this and understanding this through is is sort of building and growing teams and developing and getting the best out of teams. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I see that. I see that for you as well. It's incredible. I'd ask as well, who who, and, and what have been your influences along the way? It sounds like you had that, um, you made a great quote before about curiosity, you know, and always sort of looking inwardly. You have different influences along the way, be it, be it people that you've kind of viewed as mentors or um, friends even and, and then 
you know, semi-famous people, podcasts, um, Sheree Cunningham, you know, whoever that may be uh, or, or not be. Add Sheree Cunning to the list. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Famous. You have to you say you forgot that. that three, yeah. three C's, you forgot that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I think natural curiosity um, is, is, is the key point, Andy. Um, always over time, I think I've always had a really kind of strong kind of almost in, introverted learning that's always going on in the background um, and that's whether it's obviously there's so much available now whether it's YouTube or podcast but plenty of, of those people I was speaking to you guys um, just earlier around one of my favourite people to listen to is a, a man named Charles Charles Eisenstein um, who's written a few books um, and is a, a bit of a, an inspirational modern day philosopher but I think even the, the, the types of The profiles of people have changed over the journey, but from a very early age, I think um, establishing mentors Mm. and getting those in place, and even if that wasn't a a sort of an interactive relationship, really observing people who I felt like were the most successful, really successful in the field that I wanted to get after and just modelling myself on those people was a really important part of of, um, kind of developing myself and just that sort of relentless pursuit of, developing yourself yeah that's great I think it's so so wise the mentoring from afar sometimes as well yeah it's great and my, my dad was really instrumental in that he was um, a football coach um, so our relationship at times growing up was often like a, a high performance athlete kind of thing and, and he was um, really in uh, kind of strong that getting good asking people to be your mentor and getting that relationship in place um was really important and i i did that from a young age at um in a football sense and and as you're going through the the junior development pathways sort of on reflection getting those people in your corner they they really become your champions Mm. um and people more often than not love to be asked and um kind of give back and and um, I, I feel like those relationships over the journey have become really integral to your progress if that's your bag and, yeah. and that's the sort of thing that you're after. And I, I think it's so important and um, I'm not sure about this answer for you, but I'm curious to know, Are you? would you consider you're a mentor for, for younger people at the moment? Have you got people that call you regularly for mentorship outside of Felix? Um not in a formal sense so much. I don't have like a, a formal mentee, mentor-mentee relationship or something. On, yeah. on the go at the moment. But even with um, certainly at work I've got relationships where um, over time there's been mentorship and yes. um, people that I've, I've really invested into. Um, and by um, reciprocation – that they're people that really seek out sort of kind of guidance and feedback and and, and insight. Um, but even w- just sort of relationships with friends sometimes, that sort of yeah. um, it doesn't need to be mentor menteeship, but what they're going through and just kind of, I'm sure you guys have these conversations yeah. as well, just kind of decision-making frameworks and helping them understand how to navigate yeah. things. Yeah, yeah I think... Um, well, I mean, even unofficially, many questions you've asked me over the last couple of years where you just asked me a question and go, oh, yeah, I've got to think on that. Like, so it's really provokes a lot of thought, which I appreciate. One of the things that you mentioned before and I, and I really see in working with you and your team is about you building high-performing teams and, and that's a huge strength. One thing people might not realise is you're based in Melbourne and majority of the team, we've, you've got a um, Philippines group of um, team over in the Philippines, but m- most of the team are based here in Brisbane. And I think one of the current day struggles so many people are having is how do you keep connection and um, how do you build community and cohesion of a, a great team when you're not physically together? And as a CEO, you're not here all the time. So, and the last few years, being in Melbourne, you haven't been able to be here physically. So what are some practical ways that you keep building that team and those relationships? Yeah, it's um, that's been an interesting part of our journey and I guess um, exacerbated as we went through COVID mm. and were locked sort of in our houses down in Melbourne for the better part of 18 months and we also – um, happened to go through our entire IPO process remotely oh d- during gosh. that process. So I think um, James, my CFO, and myself, um, our corporate advisors, our lawyers, 
the auditors, accountants, and, um, the ASX. No one was in the same room through that entire sort of 12-month process. So there, there's a case study just in, in and of itself because we are probably, I think, one of the only ones and there hasn't been many IPOs since. Um, uh, that... That was really, and I, I think since that period, why I brought that up was that probably really, like everywhere, really enforced our ability to kind of work remotely, sort mm. of at, at scale together. Um, and how to, my biggest fear, because I've always been able to manage from an individual perspective, I've always sort of got up every couple of weeks, every few weeks, whatever's sort of required and yes. maintain presence. And for me, um, I kind of get a lot of my energy when I'm here yeah. with the team and, and in person, and, and you find if you if you haven't done that for for a period, it just sort of starts to eat eat away at you. Um, yeah. So so that and and that's probably become more challenging with the, the sort of the the um, hybrid working environment to be able to see everyone um, as much of the time um, moving forward. But my biggest fear with that was in a broader sense, as we sort of moved to sort of remote working more en masse, was how do we maintain the co- like the the DNA of our culture, mm. which more so often is built on that sort of office environment. For us as an, as an organisation as a whole, that's always been a really – it's been our heartbeat. Yes. Um, as, has been that um, – that sort of that Brisbane headquarters, which has shifted around from um, Truss's house to a sort of a, 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 um, an, a an old gym in uh, in Newstead, and, and now we're in Tenerife, and we've been in Hendra, so we've moved around a little bit. But how do we maintain the that DNA and that X factor in our culture? Because mm. we've always felt that our culture was special. And I think we've had a lot of people come and, and go through Felix over time. But the one thing that, that people sort of say and, and say back to us is that the culture was so special mm. there yes. and it's unlike anywhere I've ever worked. So, you know, how do we maintain that um, if we're more distributed and we're not seeing each other and don't have those interpersonal things? And I think like anything that's just, giving consideration we're probably over indexing on the, th- the the tools that now do connect us more often than not and um i know that you've helped us with a few of these things some little just um thinking about the little easter eggs or whatever they are the little just kind of details around how we can still thread and weave culture through um what may be sort of at times just sort of impersonal just technical tools to yeah. connect us but how can we overlay our culture and embed that through those tools i think we've we've really focused on it to yeah. make sure that we don't lose um or it's not a threat of losing what we built yeah yeah so important and uh, and particularly what the whole culture of people being hybrid and then you physically now that you can be here i yeah. think that's a wonderful thing but we we had a laugh because i think We've all, I'd say we're just shy of two years doing workshops with, with Felix and yeah. last month was the first one you've been in person yeah. Uh, because, yeah, we just haven't, you just weren't able to for so many of those sessions. You yeah. literally were locked down. We did your core values and purpose for the whole organisation or relaunch those and you were remote. So, yeah, it's just, I guess you just got to play think, with what's in front of you, right? Yeah, and um, sponsored post. I think that speaks to your <laughs> skill and expertise as a, as a facilitator <laughs> to weave that in and, and not just myself but some of our, our leaders in Manila as well and um, that's got to be challenging as a facilitator to have <laughs> three quarters of the room <laughs> in the room and, and that, that you've done that so well. The most recent one that we had in Brisbane, I was just so excited to be up for it and it was my favourite yet and just sort of just being in the room. Um, I was like, yeah, it was like sort of, uh, I'm not going to say first day at school because no one looks forward to that, but <laughs> it was just, I was like a kid in a candy store. Candy yeah. And it is the energy of being in a room with, yeah. with everyone or most, mostly everyone. Yeah, beautiful. One thing actually, you, we've never talked about this, so if you then tell me no, um, but one thing you mentioned before, you know, seeing the team, some of people have been working with you for a decade and seeing them all grow up in the different stages of life. You two are a dad. Um, how has being a dad, how has been being a family changed you and grown you? 
it's aged me. <laughs> <laughs> like all of us. Yep. <laughs> Where did my life go? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, How old are your kids now? I have a, do- a little beautiful girl named Pippa. She's just turned five. Um, which was pretty funny because she spent a month just f- before she turned five telling everyone she was four and 11 twelfths. <laughs> smart girl. So she's a, she's had a 50 year old uh, mermaid birthday party, and um, here we are. So, um, like, yeah, we, uh, we sort of count the, the Felix babies that have sort of come through. Um, and we've even had people who met at Felix and have had babies together and they've sort of moved on to, to different parts of their, their journey now. Um, but we've sort of, in, in concert, you grow up through yeah. the business and it's you grow into that different stage of life and I think you it, it's a much more sort of purposeful stage of your life mm. and um, fulfilling um, being, being a dad or a parent. Your reason... For, uh, for being and for doing what we're doing and your outlook. And I think it does reshape um, the way that you lead. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's inevitable. And one thing that I can think of was um, when we I immediately sort of having gone through sort of birth and, and early childhood, just immediately went, revisited our parental leave policy. Did um, you? Um, yeah. Immediately and just sort of having not having the insight, the sort of lived experience prior to that, but then prior to going through, I was like, that's not enough. It's a really important time and we need to support our people to be able to have that time and, and not feel pressured enough space from work and, and feel supported by work that, that they're there and they're on deck for, for that. Yeah, um, that's great. That's um, great. So I, that's just a, a sort of a, a little sort of policy example, but mm. I think it, um, you guys as parents know, you, yeah. your outlook just, it just changes. Completely changed. And I think in, in so many ways, like where you go, okay, well, what is the example? You know, we talk about the mentorship and looking at people and role modeling, like there's no greater role model in a kid's life than their parents. And I think it's being so conscious of what kind of example do I want to set uh, as a, as a female as well, having a daughter, I think, okay, well, what do I want my daughter to be able to see as possible for women Mm -hmm. um, with that kind of nuance? And also just what is life and work all for? I don't know how often you think about that, but um, you know, earning money, running a business, yes, the sacrifice or the, of where you put your time even, um, what's it all for and is it all worth it? And just constantly asking yourself that question. And it abs- for me in this moment, you go, yeah, yeah, it absolutely is because you've got the balance or the flexibility, a lot of work and working hard and also taking the breaks and having the holidays and Taylor Swift's coming to town, so we'll be flying to Melbourne and spending God knows what I just on sent Taylor my Swift. Wife that screenshot this morning of the two Melbourne concerts yes. coming in February. Well, we might be staying on your couch, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, you know, going right. Well, that's what we work for, isn't it? To to fly down and get some tickets and have those moments as a family. So yeah, for me, I, it's definitely role modelling and asking what's it all for. So clearly the purpose of work is to deliver outsized uh, returns to our shareholders over time yes. uh, in a sustainable <laughs> way. Um, of course. <laughs> but that I think that balance that you speak to is just is so critical. And for, for me it's when you think back and reflect over time and also sort of observe the world around you, I think that it's amazing how often you find that work works out better for you and works better for you when those things are in harmony and that mm. balance and you, you feel like you've got those things sort of bedded down and, and aligned right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just kind of, it unfolds for you. Um, yes. It absolutely does. We've been talking about this a, a little bit lately in terms of um, things being um, magnetic in life that, that you're attracting the right things as opposed mm-hmm. to things being graspy where in particular you just – forever reaching is just not quite sticking. And hustle, I think hustle, hustle. The hustle, hustle, hustle. And the hustle is, is important and necessary yeah. from time to time. Absolutely. It's a, a bit of a seasonal thing. But if all you're ever doing is being a bit graspy and, and hustling and, and and it just doesn't kind of need a balance of both, I think, at different stages. Everything is magnetic, Andy. Everything's resonating at a, at a frequency. Isn't um, it? It's just energy. starting to get into that spiritual yeah, sort of, um, yeah. detail. But I'm, saw, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm uh, here for it too. I just saw something float in above uh, you no, actually. No, yeah. no, no. Um, it's so true. And I think just being receptive and I, I, sort of what the, the – to sort of peel back where we're, 
where you're getting at there. Often it's sometimes it's just letting it come to you. And mm. if you're hustling and on the hustle and just sort of relentlessly just sort of grinding for something to, to no end that anyway, just without the words coming to me, just being receptive for that that coming and knowing yeah. that you've done the work. and Yeah. It kind of right. comes back to your three C's though as well, right? Because if you're confident yeah, really yeah, does. that you've done the work and, and you have conviction around why I'm doing this and what it's all for and and not to um, dismiss, sometimes you still need to sell and do that, like there's there's an element of a how do you promote a business? So I don't want people to think, oh, we're saying not to hustle, like you don't do the posts and send the EDMs. Yeah. Like you've got to promote things but it's more that – that feeling like it's an uphill battle all the time and it's desperation. But if you've got that conviction and you've got that confidence and you've got, what was your first C? Character. The character. Like if, if you are uniquely you, authentically you, and you've got that confidence of why we're here and I'm adding value in some way, then I think it com- that's my belief, then it comes to you. Yeah, I think it's a really a really good sort of overlay to, to that, Triple C framework. Um, you might want to trademark that because I think we're about to use it. It's all yours. Um, is that if if you if you believe with your team that you've got the right strategy and the right plan mm. and you've done the work to to sort of get the plan right and then you've done the right things to execute the plan and you've put the work in and everyone can look each other in the eye and go, we've done the work. Then I think as sort of to resonate on your point, as as leaders, what we need to be really conscious and aware of is what's the right level of stress Yes, that I'm going to A, internalise and C, sort of exude and imprint on others around me to sort of create the right environment and drive the outcome. And sometimes that needs to be a level of stress because, hey, this outcome is really important to us and it's not just that tick and flick, we've, we've done the work, we need to be sort of really focused and dialed in on this. But if your level of stress is becoming so sort of like overbearing and anxiety riddled and you're just permeating that yes. to all of those around you, then I think your destruction of that cultural environment around you is, it can be really um, critical and adverse. Yes, and, I think and have long-lasting negative impact. It yeah. becomes a bit toxic. And maybe that's... Um, a thread of leading with courage is knowing when to just dial that back and have confidence in the work that you've done and the plan and that you will continue to do to achieve those outcomes. But some things are out of your control. Yes. Mm. And we're always dependent on clients and customers and prospects and the world around us, the environment, the macroeconomic environment, supply chain issues, and things are going to be out of your control. An external swirl is constant. So yes. I think managing that sort of stress level internally and sort of around you is really, really important. Yeah, and and it is that almost acceptance of what is going around you and almost the surrendering to it because that part we can't control. So then the more that we can just accept that that is what is, so then how do I play what do I need to do with what is in front of me that I can control, whether it's the circle of control or the um, locus or control, whatever the CIA acronyms, whatever everyone kind of references, but what do I choose to accept just is? And then within ourselves, I love that concept of stress because I've saw, I've recently seen a graph that showed, you know, if there's no pressure, even stress that, uh, sorry, pressure then building into stress, if there's no pressure, then it almost becomes apathy and mm. low performance. So we need a level of pressure where there's like that adrenaline and that go, go, go. And there's that level where it's at peak performance when you've got enough of that, that you're like, yeah, this is really driving my behavior then it can tip over into stress where it becomes an unhealthy measurement of stress. Now, what a a new uh, a, a 19-year-old coming out of university into their first workplace job, you know, with um, a smooth upbringing, their level of stress might look different to someone who's walked a long, long path um, versus, a you know, someone at the retirement that's been through all sorts of different seasons of their life and they're like, oh, none of this is stressful because their perspective in life is different. So I think the level of stress that we we see as, you know, the tipping point is so individual, but it's recognised we've got to bring the hustle, like the stress, the hustle, the pressure, whatever words, to the right extent. I, you really 
really, really make me think around, well, how much am I permeating out every day? Is Am I bringing more joy than stress? Mm. You know, what is that balance that people around me and your customers and your team, your family, what are they all seeing? Because that really creates a big imprint, doesn't it? Totally. And I think to your point, Cherie, uh, as, a, as a leader, whether it's a, a business or sort of in any field, it's probably a manifestation of the confidence and belief that you've got in the team members around you and the, dri- the drive and internal stress that they bring in and of themselves to deliver an outcome. Yeah. And you know that you don't need to sort of be there and, and micromanaging or sort of overseeing every detail because you've got a belief in their capability and the, the drive that they're going to bring just within themselves to mm. an outcome. And I think that sort of as a leader, if you're confident that you've built that around you, then you've got more confidence to sort of take a step back and, yes. and sort of harness and harmonise more than you need to. I would feel terrible anxiety if the, I felt like the team around me just sort of were just phoning it in and um, I didn't have conviction or belief that they were just sort of turning up or had any drive to, to get the job done. I'd just yeah crawl up and die, really. Yeah, it would just be <laughs> way too hard. And I think that does come back to the um, the leader's role of painting the vision and the, the goals and having the plan of where we're going because often I think some leaders can go, oh, my team aren't doing this, this and this. But then when you go, okay, well, what, what is the plan? Where are you going? What what do you – how do you need people to behave? Like what are those core values that they're aligning to as well as the performance? that's probably the, the leader's first check is have I set that up clearly? And then if I have, then it's on the individual. But often I think individuals can maybe get a hard time because you go, oh, well, you're not doing this, this and this, but the leader hasn't set the yeah. the framework yet. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really great point. I think as a leader when you speak, if um, your credibility, people mm. are going to judge you. Um, with what you're saying against how you've how you've acted, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This three C's, like this is a knockout framework. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I've already first. written the episode intro yeah. on my um, <laughs> on my notepad here. Yeah. So um, we've got two more questions for you, and, and we'll get you out of here if you like. Um, the uh, one of them is, what is a non-negotiable you have for your life? A non-negotiable that I have for my life. I think that I, I think for me, it's it's continuing to learn. Mm. And and I will, if if I'm not learning, then I'm just I'm, I'm going the other way, <laughs> and just sort of so that that for me and and, and learning and it I th- it's it's always sort of learning with with purpose and and understanding and it's sort of it's probably a a kind of a a, a search. I remember when Jules and I, uh, my wife, we were travelling through um, Barcelona and there was this a most amazing door with with letters and gold embossed letters and the rest was sort of just in matte colour and I can't remember how the phrase is in Spanish but it's the, the search for truth. Ah. And I just think that that's always stuck with me, that photo and just the learning of just whether that's within yourself mm. and understanding and self-mastery and, and sort of getting better and leading with courage and overcoming yourself and uh, mastering that or the sort of the world around you and understanding how things work and mechanics and growing businesses and scaling businesses or um, the environment, society and humanity, whatever yeah. it is, just kind of continuing to improve. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. That's a, I'll come back at five that. and ten years' time and we can see if I'm still holding my yeah. <laughs> that's a That's a cracking answer. I love that, the learning with purpose mm-hmm. and understanding. Love that. And last but not least, what's the kindest thing anyone has ever done for you? I'd say it's hard to go past your parents. Nice. And who brought you into the world and having what have I learnt as a parent? Yeah. Um, the, the sacrifice and the commitment that they make, asking for nothing in return, mm. all of which is forgotten. <laughs> not by choice. No. Just as we are... Um, uh, we have um, what's a, what's the word when evolved you, or grown, no? Like, when you forget, we are uh, when we, we forget. Amne- am, no. Yes, we're amnesia. Yeah, we're yeah. Like um, just as a species, like yeah. we, it's amazing how much of our experience and our body of experience that we forget. Yes. Um, so the work that they've done, the selflessness, and the, I think the financial commitment and 
my parents certainly, and I think the generation before us were so much younger mm. when they had kids and they yes. were early 20s and I think, God, like you you really put it all out there and you raised us and we've turned out okay like <laughs> us as kids and um, um, I, th- I think that's the, the kind of thing that just, you know, parenting kids mm. is just, it's a... We don't thank our parents often enough. Mum and Dad, if you're listening, thank you. I love you. Yeah, my mum and Dad, thank you. I love you too. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. You want to say that too, Andy? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to all the mums and dads. <laughs> to Thanks, all the Andy and Jamie. And thank you. Father's uh, Day coming up. But like you're that. right, right, because I even think I was 35 when I was pregnant with Chloe. My my mum gave birth to me at 25. God, I don't even want to think about what yeah, I was so like I'm at almost, 25. I'm almost exactly the same as you. Yeah. Just, yeah. I was there, in no way, shape or form was I prepared to have a child. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, even at 35 I was yeah. pushing it. But no, it's, yeah, that's incredible. That's beautiful. Well, Mike, thank you so much for spending the time to be here with us. I've, I feel like I can just keep talking to you all day. Perhaps when we actually hit record, stop, we probably will. But um, it's always a pleasure the modern day philosopher, I do think this is you, um, the framework of the three C's. But it's such a such an honour to be able to work with you and your team and, and thank you for your time to be here and share your thoughts on Lead With Courage and your story. Cherie and Andy, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've been a long time podcast listener, so it's um, wonderful to participate in one like this. I've had a lot of fun. Um, Luminate have been an incredible part of our journey oh, at Felix. You. So I'm excited to continue your, this part of your journey with you and excited for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for joining us on the Lead with Courage podcast. We illuminate leadership and it's our mission to inspire and grow the leaders of today to create a better tomorrow. We hope and trust that this episode has given you some insights and joy to empower you to live your biggest, best life. If you did enjoy the episode, we'd be so grateful for you to rate and share wherever you listen to this podcast. And until next time, go and lead with courage. Luminate Leadership is not a licensed mental health service or a substitute for professional mental health advice, treatment or assessment. Any conversation in this podcast is general in nature. And if you're struggling, please see a healthcare professional or call Lifeline on 131114.